Uh, yeah, so first of all, I'm an Oracle employee and I'm obliged to show you this slide at the beginning. It's a safe harbor statement. It basically says that uh, um, uh, anything I say is not on behalf of Oracle and it's only my opinion. So I have to show you this. Okay, so now that's, that, that's out of the way. Let's talk about uh, distributed computing. So, once upon a time, there used to be a language called the APL. Probably most people in this room don't really know how to program many interesting things in APL, or maybe don't even remember what it is. I certainly don't. Um, but the thing about APL is that APL has great syntax. And this program that you see uh, on, this, on the slide, uh, don't ask me to explain why, but apparently what it does, it, it computes this set of prime, prime numbers between 2 and R, where R is some number. Uh, I mean, it might look a little bit cryptic, but apparently this, this language was uh, visionary in the sense that uh, this little expression that you see here, it uh, contains things like things that we know and, and care about, things like four comprehensions and reduces and, and even the, the drop statement that you see on Scala collections today. I then don't explain, don't ask me to explain why because I don't know any APL. But uh, APL also had a flaw and the flaw was not its syntax, it was something else. APL was a little bit different than most programming languages that you know about today in the following sense. So in APL, there was a special group of people called the APL developers, which basically sat around all day and they, they were implementing language features. And APL consisted of a large number of intrinsics, of special statements which had very special meaning, which you might have derived from the previous expression, uh, this hieroglyphic expression that you saw on the previous slide. So here we see this, this guy who's, who's basically implementing intrinsics of this basic language. And now APL, was a language that people loved. And as a result, there were power users using the languages all the time. And you can see that this guy is a power user because he's rugged, he has a beard, doesn't have too much time to shave himself because he spends all the time with APL. And now what these power users do, they from time to time figure out some great concepts. Like for example, this constant pi, which previously was not in the language. And when this happens, the APL user has a great idea. Why don't I contribute this constant pi back to APL? And now, when I say APL wasn't this language in the sense most languages today are, what I mean is that APL didn't have a concept of a standard library, or it didn't have concepts of libraries that you know today at all, which meant that this user couldn't share his constant pi with other developers right away. What he had to do is go to the language developer and then hand him over this constant pi, at which point the language developer would do his voodoo on the constant pi, invest a lot of time to integrate it into APL. And another thing about APL was that once you integrated this into APL, this same thing with the same meaning had a very, very different uh, look once it got integrated into the language. So it wasn't this thing that a user would write, it was something else. And the negative effect here was that basically the user now had to, with the next release of APL, go through his program which invoked the constant pi, pass it to some function, and replace every occurrence with pi with this new intrinsic. And when the power user figured out what he need, needs to do, the net effect was that power user started fleeing the language. Now Lisp was another great language, and it was great in the sense that unlike APL, it was more uniform. And when I say more, more uniform, what I mean is that what the user wrote in his library, it felt more like a Lisp program, like, like a basic Lisp uh, language. And it, Lisp had con a concept of libraries to begin with, which meant that developers could share what they do without going necessarily through the, through the language author as a central authority. And now, of course, it looked and, and feel, felt like Lisp, only assuming that the user had good taste, but that's a detail. And the, Lisp was, the reason why Lisp uh, was more uniform is because it was minimal. What do I mean by that? Well, everything in Lisp is a list. So for example, this is a list. A list is, a, in this case, 
a list of three elements, numbers one and two, and the third element is another list with elements three and four, which is a nested list. Expressions in Lisp are just named lists. An expression is a list whose first element is a name, in this case plus, where I basically saying to Lisp that I want to add numbers three and four together. Statement is also an expression. In this case, the statement is an if statement, and its name is an if. The first argument is a condition, and the second two arguments are expressions, which are the if, then, and the else branch. Named functions are also expressions in Lisp. In this case, the expression is named defun, and the function that I wish to name is the successor function on natural num numbers. So here I say, define a successor function called capital S, which has a parameter list n, a number, and then its body, the expression that it evaluates it, adds n plus one. That's a successor. But very importantly, this minimality meant that Lisp could grow. And in Lisp, you could define functions, and you still can, which do things that, you, that weren't originally a part of the base language. So if you wanted to define something which is a struct, you could define implement a special function called devstruct to which you game, give a name of your struct and then you give its members and their initial values. So here I declare using this user function potentially a pair of, of numbers of, of fields x and y with initial values zero. And you could go beyond that. You could def basically implement a function which defines a class called vector which extends pair and then give it a method, a member method which is called absolute, which gives you the absolute value of that vector. And really, this is only scratching the surface. You can go much, much, much further than that. So you can think about how would you encode multiple inheritance in this first class generic functions, multi-methods, first class classes, or pretty much everything that you might have seen in a language called beta, which is particularly advanced on these concepts. And I uh, urge you to take a look at it if you have time. So there's no doubt in my mind that Lisp does it right. And when I say does it right, what I mean is it states, starts with a few minimal concepts and then uses them to build powerful abstractions in terms of these few minimal concepts. And this is useful because if you want to understand Lisp, you only need to learn these basic few concepts and then from there on you only need to read what other people did. There's a, the learning curve in Lisp is, uh, is actually very small. You already know Lisp, if you didn't see it before. But Lisp is not popular today. And um, to understand maybe better why, one thing that's useful is to, is to show, is to, is to talk about an anecdote uh, which happened apparently many years ago. And so many years ago, there were two approaches, two, two, two schools of design in software engineering. One was called the MIT approach, and the other one was called the New Jersey approach. Now, the MIT approach was known for things like Lisp, and the proponents of the MIT approach worked at the time mainly on artificial intelligence. That was before the artificial intelligence start, stopped being cool and became cool again. So it was a very long time ago. And uh, the proponents of the New Jersey approach were a group of people who worked on C and on Unix. And at one point, two people who were very famous people and proponents of this approach, they met uh, at, uh, at some place and uh, they started talking about Unix because it turned out that the MIT person was actually quite versed in C and quite versed in Unix because the MIT people too were writing their own operating systems and the names of these operating systems you never heard about because they don't anymore uh, exist today. But basically he understood the Unix kernel sources and he had some questions to ask to this New Jersey person. And in particular what they talked about was something called the PC losering problem. In the PC losering problem, Basically, it's a problem from operating systems design. So you have a process, a user process, which basically is a program that executes uh, a sequence of instructions. 
And at some point during its execution, as it calls the different subroutines in this user process, at some point it might call the, the system, the operating system level subroutine. And when it happens, normally the, 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 the user process effectively spends some time in the kernel and then comes back. But what can happen during this period of time is that an external interrupt arrives from the CPU as a response to some external event. And then the system level subroutine needs to respond to this interrupt. And typically what it means for an interrupt is that it would have to store the current state of the user process. And now, of course, the system subroutine doesn't know what kind of a user process this is. It doesn't know if this is a process that was written in Lisp or if it was written on C or, or in JVM. And all of these different approaches to writing user processes have very, very different uh, set of assumptions and uh, calling conventions, registers they use, uh, flags that they set in the CPU, and, and, and so on. And uh, so basically, at this point, the system subroutine has two options. It can either rewind the program counter of the user process back to the point where it originally called the subroutine, or it can push forward and exit the subroutine even though it didn't complete it correctly, and then hand it off to the user process to actually save the state of the process, because the user process is the only one that knows how to do this. And that was, that was a problem at the time in operating systems design. The MIT person was reading Unix kernel sources, and then he had a question, where is the code that handles this case? Because it wasn't there. And the response from a New Jersey person was that <laughs> it's not there. Basically, what happens if you get an interrupt in this way is that the system level subroutine jumps back to its exit point and just returns a special code to the user process. But then basically what this meant for the user process is that it can call normal subroutines in a normal, normal way, but if it had to call a system subroutine, then it had to call them in a while loop. If the system subroutine returned a special value, basically uh, it had to be called again. And this was, this was a big uniformity, non-uniformity in the way you call normal subroutines and system subroutines. All of a sudden, they're not the same concept. But the New Jersey person argued, yes, that's the right trade-off to make. And the MIT person immediately thought that's not the right thing to do. And now C is everywhere today. And all, you all know about Unix, but not, you don't know about this other operating system. And Lisp is not everywhere. Some people may have heard about Lisp, and some, some did not. And then how was the list, the question, is the right thing? And from this anecdote, I'd like to uh, point out the following moral, which says that it is undesirable to go for the right thing first. It is better to get half of the right thing available so that it spreads like a virus. For example, instead of providing list and its garbage collection and advanced compiler optimizations, you just do C, which doesn't have any automatic memory management, and doesn't have any um, very advanced uh, optimizations to start with. And then once people are hooked on it, take the time to improve it to the 90% of the right thing. So if you did C, do, do, just do C++. Another maybe less pessimistic uh, moral here is that a language should plan for growth. It should start small and grow as the set of users grow. And maybe a different way of saying this is that when you're designing a language, you should, be, you should strive to be minimal. And because you have only a, a limited amount of time to do these things, you should strive to, to do right only those things which enable other person, other people to get things right. And speaking of users, one, one way it's, I find it useful to, to think about them is that you, to divide them is basically into this, these three groups. So first of all, when you're talking about a language, you have a language designer. It's the crazy guy here on the left with, a, uh, with, a, with a, some sort of a potion. And there's another set of users, which are called the power users. And these are the people who often contribute back to the language and have interesting things to tell you and to give you back. And then there's a third group of users called the end users which is this guy with a, a poor taste of glasses and, and a pitchfork in his hand. And, and this free set of users, they, they're, they're somehow different, and they have a different set of concerns. And this is why they're divided with these dotted lines here. And uh, 
I think that every good designer will tell you that did, in general this need not be necessarily three different people because um, today you might be a language designer but tomorrow you might be a person holding the pitchfork which basically means tomorrow you will have a different set of concerns. The guy on the right is not less intelligent than the guy on the left. He just has a different set of concerns and this is what the pitchfork symbolizes. Now, the question is, from all this, what does it have to do with distributed systems? Well, today we have a lot of distributed systems around, and distributed systems are basically just a lot of processes which proceed in parallel, concurrently to each other, and they do some computations. And if I were to design a distributed programming model, the question is, how would I do it? Well, first of all, I would start off as the person holding the pitchfork. I would not design my own language. I would pick another language that already exists out there and which had made the right set of trade-offs, which was designed to grow in the first place. So, and then, if I wanted to make a programming model, I would have to name it something. So I will, make, I will name this programming model the reactor model, and I will name these computations which proceed in parallel to each other reactors. So here you see a piece of code with which you can declare a specific reactor. This reactor is called the analysis reactor. To say that it's a reactor means to extend the reactor base class. And then within the, the curly braces, I need to define some sort of a state which is inherent to that, to that reactor. In this case, I say it's a variable called total length, which is initialized to zero. Declaring the reactor doesn't yet start it. This is just a template for reactor computations to start. If I actually wanted to start, I have to call this spawn method with a template, and I can call it so many times. Now, these computations, they wouldn't be very interesting to begin, to begin with if they didn't somehow exchange information. If everything was trivially parallelizable, then it would be very easy to make distributed systems. But it's not the case. Sometimes, uh, two different reactors need to talk to each other and give each other the results uh, of what they are computed. And the way we do this, the, the way I will do this in the reactor model is to say that I have an entity called a channel. This channel is typed. And to this, on this channel I can send events, which are basically objects, pieces of information, and I can send them to the owner of the channel. When I say that the channel is typed, I mean that you have to put the type of the channel in, in, in square brackets after it. And that will mean that all the objects I send along the channel will have to have this type. In this case, it's a string, and I'm sending a string called event payload to the channel. I have the guarantee that if I send something to the channel, it will eventually arrive to the owner of the channel. So there's only one owner, but many, many potential writers to the channel. And if I now take a closer look at the boundary of a reactor, so the boundary is the place that divides the inside state of a reactor with the outside world, then what I see on the boundary of the reactor is this connector. Connector is basically just an entry point which connects the outside world and the channel to the inside world and something called an event stream within the reactor. An event stream is basically just an entity on which you can observe and look at and when this event entity delivers an event from an outside world then you can pick it up and you can react to it and typically you would react to it by modifying some sort of internal state of that reactor. Here's an example. Recall the state total length that I defined in the reactor previously. In this case, every reactor is created with some sort of a main connector because that's convenient to do. And every connector has an event stream. If I want to access it, I call dot events on that connector. Now, if I want to actually observe the events which are coming in on an event stream, then I have to call this onEvent method, to which I give a lambda, which says, when you receive a string, take the length of that string and use it to increase the total length of all the strings that you received so far. Here's a simple example of a reactor. However, a reactor is not limited to a single connector. It can have many connectors. And what Every, in this programming model, what every reactor gets created with is the system connector, which has an associated system event stream. I have found this useful because many kinds of events that uh, a reactor might care about are common to all the reactors. And these system events 
will be something that talks to the reactor about when was I created, when was I stopped, when was I scheduled on some CPU. So typically what I could do with this kind of a system event stream, whose type is an event of system events, I would declare some sort of a local variable which says how many times I was scheduled on some certain CPU. And then I would match a subset of possible events which are the system events. So I would say, in case I'm scheduled, I will increase the schedule count by one. And in case I'm terminated, I will take the total length of all the strings I received before, divide them by the number of times I'm scheduled, and print that to the standard output. And by this, I will do basically effectively a small analysis saying, every time I'm scheduled on some CPU, what's the average number of bytes that I process? So it tells me something about the flow of uh, information in the system, which might be useful. Now, the important thing to note about this programming model is that it's basically these event streams, they are serializable. And that means that for any single reactor, so not multiple reactors, if you take a look at one reactor, there will always be at most one event stream emitting an event at any single point in time. So to take a look at the previous example, it's either that the lambda passed to this first event stream will be reacting to some certain event at one point, or it's the other one. But they will not, never be active at the same time. And the advantage of that is that if I have some shared state, which is shared between those event handlers, like in this case, then there will be no data releases. So I don't have to care about locks and monitors and synchronization and whatnot. It's a very useful property. And of course, you're not limited to only these two connectors in the system. You can also define custom connectors. And when you define a custom connector, I should also note that he, secretly hidden within each connector is something called an event queue. Well, if the system is serializable, basically means you cannot react to two events at the same time. That means that one of them will have to wait, and it waits in an event queue, which is just a data structure hidden in this connector. Now, you might ask, why do I want connectors in the first place? Why would they be useful? And I, I will tell you that I find these custom connectors useful when you want to define a custom protocol. And what do I mean by a protocol? Well, when I say a protocol, I mean a specific pattern of, of, uh, of exchanges of messages or events. So here's an example of a protocol to make things more concrete. Often I have a certain events coming, a set of events coming from the external world, which I then route. They're probably familiar. This, this routing process is probably familiar to you from, from networking systems, for example. You, you all have a router in your home. So what is basically a router protocol? It's, it's something that maps an event from an input channel to one of the output channels. So given a set of output channels, I want to basically do some sort of a routing. And this routing, you can do it in many different ways. It's basically some certain, certain policy that you can apply to the, to the generic routing protocol. And when you, when you have this structure, you, you, you want to name it something. So you call it a router. How would you typically implement a router in this model? Well, you could start off by defining a function, a method called router, and then giving it a lambda. And this lambda P, which is, stands for policy, basically tells you that for any event T that comes to the router, what is the channel that I should be routed to? A very general way to say what a policy is. And how would I implement this generic router given this policy? Well, first of all, I have to provide some sort of an input channel which will accept elements of type T. And this means that I will have to open a new subchannel, so I call this open statement, which is a standard construct for creating new connectors. And then I call connector.events, and I call a non-event method on that, saying that for any event which arrives in this new co connector, you should take the event, you should call the policy function on that event to get a channel for that event, and then you should send the event to that channel. And this is basically, and at the point I return, of course, the newly created channel to the, to the reactor that called this, this method. And this is a very general way to, to think about routing. Now, you might ask, what is the concrete policy that you use for routing? There are many different ones, but let's say that you're, you care about load balancing, you have a set of workers and you want to set the, the units of work somehow uniformly between those set of workers, and you have no information 
about what the set of workers are like and, and what the units of work are like. Then you might apply uh, uh, a routing policy, which many people probably heard about, which is called round robin, which basically tells you, I will always pick the next channel after the last one that I picked. If I reach the end of the list of channels that I can route to, I will start anew from the beginning. So basically, I will just rotate and keep sending my uh, events to different, to different target channels. And how do I use this? Well, given a set of output channels, I call the round robin method to get back around the robin policy object. I applied, I applied it to the router, and I get my input channel. That's it. Now the reactor can share this input channel with other reactors, and they will get their events routed according to this policy. And now, just to summarize everything I talked about, I want to say that the reactor model is, there's, there's been a lot of things on these slides, but basically the reactor model is four different, four, four small uh, minimalistic concepts. The first one is how do you start a distributed computation? You do this with spawn. This is your construct for starting something concurrently. The next one is how do you send pieces of information to other reactors? Well, for this you just use channels as we saw. How do you read events coming from different uh, reactors? You use event strings for this. And finally, if you want to create custom protocols, custom patterns of uh, message exchange, then you use this open statement to create new, new connectors. And I've been telling you this pretty much from the standpoint of this user from, with a pitchfork. But now in the rest of the talk, I want to slightly move away from that and, uh, and try showing you the system from the, from the point of view of a power user. And in doing so, I will introduce a series of protocols which depend on each other and form a certain protocol stack. And, and, and I'll try to show you how they, how they interact with each other. So one of the simplest protocols that you can think about and something that comes to mind first is the server-client protocol on which web is based and which is very, very, very widespread. And in the server-client protocol, you basically have one entity which is called the server, which has some sort of a generic mapping between the requests and the responses. On the other hand, you have a client. The client is the one initiating this protocol. He creates a request, sends it to the server, and he receives a reply back. The question is, how do you encode this protocol in the reactor model? So one thing that I find useful when thinking about protocols and thinking about functional programming in general is to think about types. You should often st start with the types, because if you get your types right, you will find that the implementation also tends to get much, much simpler. So in this case, the question is, what type of objects should the client send to the server? Should it for a protocol, server protocol, in which the request is at some object of type T and the response is some object of type S, should the client send only an object of type T, the request? If it did that, then the server would re receive this object, which is of type T, the request, but then could compute an answer, the reply, but it wouldn't really know where to send the reply to. How would it know which channel the client expects the reply on? So I argue that a better choice is to declare a new type called request of TS, which for your user level request creates a tuple of your request object of type T and a channel that you provide on which you expect the answer. In this case, channel of S. And then accordingly, if you want to declare a channel of this request type, we can give it a special name and call it a server of TS. What does the server function that look, then look like? Well, it's a method that takes uh, a generic uh, argument, which is the mapping function, f. And then the first thing you need to do is, since you're exposing a new type of a channel, you need to open it. So you open a channel of this request type from t to s. And then on the event stream, you match the incoming tuples. And tuples are pairs of a request and a channel on which you expect a reply. Then you apply the mapping function to x. You get your response, and you send it back along that reply channel. And then you take the channel, which is the server channel, just return it to the reactor that calls this, calls this method. And then he can share it with other reactors, and they can, in turn, initiate the, the server-client protocol. What does the client look like? Well, I will encode the client with this new method called 
ask or question mark, where basically I expect to get a channel of the server type, which expects requests, and I expect to also use one concrete user level request. And then what I expect, expect to get back is not an answer of type S, but an event stream of type S, something that will eventually give me a reply. And I say eventually because I cannot expect to get a reply immediately because the server might be very far away. So I cannot just block and wait for a reply. I have to return an entity which will eventually give a reply. And this is an event stream. Of course, if I'm talking to the server, I need to provide it the reply channel. So I create that reply channel of type S. And then I send the tuple of my user level request and a reply channel to the server. And I return the event stream with the reply to the user level object. And that's your client protocol. That's it. How do I instantiate this protocol now? Well, I could create some sort of data that I care deeply about called data, which is just a map in Scala. And since a map in Scala is also a function, I can pass it to the server method and instantiate a new server. Now this channel S that I got back, I can share with my clients. And that clients can ask questions. They can ask, what is the map one, number one map to? And they will receive an event on the reply event stream and eventually print it to the standard output. So you should get two if you run this program. And now, one of the things that people often ask is, you know, but how general this really is? I mean, obviously, you're only supporting one-way communication. You can only send things from one party to another party and then maybe expect a reply back, right? But, you know, in, 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 in real life network protocols like TCP, you, when you establish a connection, you often have this duplex, concept of duplex communication where you're receiving events concurrently back as you're, as you're sending them. And then some people say, basically, you should add two-way channels to your basic model. Others people say that, that you should not. I tend to agree with the second group. Because the two-way channel is basically this. First, if you want to talk about two-way communication, you have to define what's an output and what's an input. And of course, this output and input, they differ depending on whose point of view you're watching at the system. So let's assume that I'm watching at a system from the client's point of view. Then my output channel is the thing that I send, used to send things to the server. And my input event stream, this thing on the left, is the place where I expect responses or information to flow from the other direction. Now the two-way server has these roles of these two event streams and channels reversed. It, its output event stream is associated with the output channel at the client. And the input channel, things that it actually uses to send things out, is actually the channel which forwards events to the event stream on the client. And this is basically a two-way channel then in this model. There's no need to introduce a new entity, a new abstraction, and you can express it in terms of existing ones. And now, of course, if you want to establish this sort of communication, you can ask yourself, what does it take for the client and the server to exchange this pair of channels on which they need to communicate. Obviously, this input channel, which the, user, which the server uses to send events to the client, is something that originated from the client. It's something that the client originally had to create because it's the owner of that channel. And therefore, it, its logical conclusion is that the client needs to send the input channel to the server. And vice versa, the server has an output channel which it needs to send to the client. So this protocol needs to proceed in two phases. The first one is the exchange of input and output channels. And the second one is then seamless communication in this protocol. And now if you think about it, this first phase is actually something you already saw. It's sending a single request and a reply. And that's basically your server protocol, which you just saw. So taking a closer look, Basically, I'm claiming that this two-way server will need to expose some sort of a server, which is called the channel server. And to establish two-way communication, this channel server will need to accept requests whose request type is a channel for inputs, and the response type, something that sends back to the client, is a channel of outputs. So I'm reusing the server client protocol here. And similarly, of course, if I want to de define a two-way server of I.O., the channel of this type is just the channel of this request type. So how would it look like? Basically, a server, product, server client protocol starts, input channel comes in, 
the channel server maps it to an output channel. And the way it does this is by first saying, let me remember now and memorize the fact that I got an input channel from the client. And then if I want to respond, I have to create an output channel of my own. So I'll create a new output channel. I'll memorize the output events that are associated with this output channel, which is exclusively made for this two-way connection. Then I'll send the output channel back to the client. And this pair of input channel and output events is now your two-way communication obstruction on the server side. And for this reason, at the very top, I'm introducing a new type called two-way, which is parameterized by two type parameters I and O, where this two-way type is basically a tuple of a channel for inputs and event stream for outputs. So this is just my new, new kind of concept, new type alias that I introduce. Then the question is, how do I declare a two-way server method? Well, a two-way server method, recall, is a method that will start a server which starts two-way connections. That means that per one server, you might have many connections. So what the two-way server method needs to return is a tuple. And let's concentrate on the first type here, the two-way the two server of I.O. So it needs to expose a channel on which this request will initially come in. It's the first thing it needs to do. The second thing, this channel will, of course, be shared with other reactors who means to instantiate this connection. Now, the second thing that this method needs to return is an event stream of connections, because there will be multiple connections per one two-way server, potentially. So the second thing is an event stream whose elements are two-way connections, this thing I just described above. And if I want to return this tuple, obviously I will have to return the first element of this tuple, and that's a server of I.O. And if I need to return a new server, then I need to create it, right? So the first thing I do in this protocol is I call open with a two-way request type, I.O. And I remember, okay, so now I have a new connector. In the next step, I take the event stream of this connector, and the event stream of this connector that's basically just a sequence of request objects. And then for every request object, and every request object is a tuple of a request and a thing and a channel on which you need to send a reply on. For every such request, I remember what the input is. I create a new output, just like we saw in the figure, an output of type O. I send the output channel back to the client on the reply channel. And then, I re and then I basically map this event stream into a tuple of an input channel that the client gave me and the output event stream of the thing that I just created. This tuple is exactly the two-way type that you have on the top. And then finally, I return these connections and the channel corresponding to these connections to the, to the, to the program that called two-way server. And now I have my two-way connection server created. On the client side, I don't wait for anything to happen. I, I am the one that basically needs to establish connections. So I create a pair of an input event and an event stream and an input channel. I send the input channel to the server. I wait until I get a reply. And when I do, I take this tuple and basically just return it. And then the user can uh, use it in, in his user program. Now, for this, I will introduce a new method called connect, which given a two-way server, instantiates an input type, sends it to the server, and maps the, maps the output back to this two-way tuple. And then what I get back is an event stream of two-way connections, and in this case, this event stream will return exactly one connection. And that's it. That this is two-way communication. And now things that people often then ask, and what they talk about is, you know, in this model, what about reliability? I mean. We're talking about distributed systems here. And typically, we assume that we have this uh, entity called a channel. And in this entity, there's a sender and a receiver. And you know, if you send something along the sender channel, you typically just get it back on the other side. But in reality, these two entities, the sender and the receiver, they might be on very different uh, computers, which are divided by very different mediums. And typically, you call this medium in between a transport. This is some kind of a network layer on which these events have to travel. And when they do, 
on this physical layer, all kinds of strange and bad things can happen. And uh, the question then is, should you have a special entity called the reliable channel in this model, which offers some sort of reliability? Some people say yes. I say that you do not. And to validate that, basically you have to make certain assumptions about your transport. Why do I say not? Well, because I think that people who say yes immediately don't think what could go wrong on this transport. And there are any number of things that could go wrong. For example, messages could be lost, which is terrible. But you also might have transports which are uh, more kind, which don't lose the message, they just delay it indefinitely, potentially reordering these messages. And then you have channels which might duplicate or might not duplicate uh, this, this, this event that was sent along this channel. And then finally, there are, there are transports which might arbitrarily corrupt the thing that you sent over this channel. So before you start talking about reliable channels, you have to, you have to make a decision on what kind of reliability guarantees you want to give and what are the assumptions about this channel. And so if you want to talk about reliable channels, we have to assume a specific set of properties of, of, this, of this transport. And the set of properties that I will assume is that it's actually quite limited because I want to keep things simple. But you could go more complicated than that if this lecture was longer. But let's keep it simple and say that this transport layer can only delay events indefinitely. But it will ultimately deliver them to the other side. And when it delays them indefinitely, it might also reorder them, of course. And now the question is, can you express the reliable channel in terms of the entities that we saw earlier, in terms of uh, protocols like the server client or the two-way protocol? So one thing that's useful to start with is, again, the types. What would the reliable request type, a request for establishing a, a reliable connection look like? I argue that a good choice is to say that the request type is exactly the same as a request type for two-way connection for things talking in, in two different uh, directions. However, we have to specialize somehow these input and output types. In particular, the input type from the client's point of view, so the things that the client will be receiving in this connection, will be, lo uh, will be longs. will be just some sort of special things that are called timestamps. And the things that the client will send out, the output type, will be a tuple of a object that you originally wanted to send, some object of type T, and the timestamp associated to that object. And then, basically, on the server side, you can think of things in the following way. You can say, I have a two-way communication established, and I'm thinking, how can I turn this and then transform this and rewire this into an event stream which reliably, given my assumptions, delivers events? And you could do this as follows. You could start, so you could call the two-way server that we just saw for these types, long and tuple of t and long, which, you give, which would give you back a server for establishing a connection server and an event stream of two ways. This event stream of two ways is an event stream of established two-way connections. So there might be many. Then you will take this event stream of established connection, and for each connection, you will map it in the following way. You'll say that the two-way connection consists of an output channel of acknowledgments and an event stream of these tuple timestamped events. So basically, you'll create this reliable thing on the right side. And then I will call a special method called reorder, which will somehow connect this event stream and this reliable channel that needs to output things and the acknowledgments that need to be sent back to the client in a specific way. And then it just returns this reliable event stream. So I'm not showing you how to reorder these events yet. I'm just giving you a general setup. This is what you need to do first. And then you can start thinking about how do you restore order. So basically, this piece of code that you just saw, it corresponds to this figure. 
We just have the reliable event streams on one side, we have output events and input channel on the other. And now if I want to restore this order, with the given a set of assumptions which say that the event can be delayed indefinitely, but it will eventually be delivered and only once and not corrupted, I can restore order in the following way. I will keep a special variable, which is called next temp, which tells me what is the next event that I want to receive. I will also keep a priority queue of all the timestamped events I ever received. And then if an event comes in, like this event x and 1, I will compare its timestamp to the next timestamp that I expect. And if it's exactly the one that I expect, I will send the acknowledgement with this timestamp back to the client, and I will forward x to the reliable event stream, which is the output. And then I will increase the next temp to the next thing that I now expect. Now, if a different event comes in, which is this timestamp event Z3, basically the next temp I event, the, the, the next stamp that I expect is not three, it's it's two. So something went wrong. It means that some of the events got delayed. And I cannot deliv deliver Z3 because if I did it, I would I would lose the order. So I take Z3 and I put it to a priority queue and keep it there until later, until I'm ready to actually deliver it. Now, if later this delayed event Y2 actually arrives at the server, then I can compare it to the stamp that I expected. It's 2, so it's fine. I do the same thing as before, send the acknowledgement to the client, and forward Y to the reliable output event stream, and increase the next stamp. And then as long as my priority queue is non-empty, I can keep flushing it. And of course, as long as the smallest element of the priority queue corresponds to the next stamp that I expect. And this is how I restore order. And here's the method that does it. And I'm not going to go into details, but I ask you to trust me that I got this one right. Now, on the client side, what you need to do is do a similar kind of wiring. You have a reliable channel to which you send events. It has a corresponding send stream. And then it has an event stream of acknowledgments on the right side coming from the server. And it has an output channel on which it sends the, the, the timestamped events. Additionally, since every element, so every uh, event that I send to the server can be indefinitely delayed, I will require that this uh, client is nice. And it's nice in the sense that it makes sure not to overflow the server with too many events. Because if they're indefinitely uh, delayed, I could send many events over the transport and then uh, expect that they'll all get delivered, but maybe they're just delayed. And that means that the priority queue on the server side just blows up. So I'll be, as a client, I'll be nice, and I'll ensure that this doesn't happen. And for this, I will declare something called a window size, where I'll say I can send at most two, in this case, events, if I didn't receive acknowledgments for them yet. And again, I have to declare a method that does this, that opens this sort of a reliable channel, and it has to wire up the event streams and channels, exactly in the way that you saw in the previous figure. And then how do you wire these things on the left to these things on the right? Basically, you need three things. You need a variable which tracks the last stamp that you sent. You need the variable that tracks the last acknowledgement that you got from the server. And then, since this thing may exceed the window size, it means that you won't be able to send all the events immediately, but you'll have to buffer them. So you need this buffer object as well. And then if I want to send x, the client will have to create a tuple x1. Since 0 minus 0 was less than window size, uh, I can just forward the timestamp event to the output channel, increasing the last stamp. I do the same thing if I want to say send y2. I increase the last stamp. But now if I want to send an event z, Basically, the buffer, uh, you need to store it in the buffer because last stamp minus last act is 2, and 2 is not smaller than window size. And then later, if uh, and when the acknowledgement arrives from the, from the server, then I increase this last act counter. And now, since time 2 minus 1 is less than 2, I can flush it. I can just send it to the output, increasing my last stamp. And now things that people immediately then ask, but okay, this is just one-way communication. Can we have reliable two-way communication? Well, I argue that actually 
you've seen this pattern before. In two-way communication, you have to somehow exchange a set of channels that two, two parties have. And here, in the first step, you will not send the reliable channel to the server. Instead, you will send it a server on which it can establish a reliable connection. And vice versa, the server will need to reply with a reliable output server, a place where the client can establish the connection. And then they will establish these connections, and they will able, be able to, to, to communicate in two directions reliably. And just a high-level picture of how this would work is that you take a reliable input, basically the server would get a reliable input channel server. It would use it to, to take its events, event stream of this reliable input, and then send back a reply with a reliable output channel, and then get, basically use it to, to, to establish a connection, and when the connection is established, uh, just use this channel to communicate. And similarly, you would do a very similar thing on the other side. You would create a new reliable input channel server, which we know how to do by now. You send it to the server, but the server sends it its reliable input server. We use that to create a connection. When we get a reply back, we have a two-way connection established. And this two-way connection is now reliable, because it's made of reliable channels, not normal channels. And then one typical um, question, and it's a good question that people ask is, well, wait a minute, don't these event streams have some sort, some notion of back pressure? And this is what a lot of people asked, and one person also asked this today in the morning. And uh, the end, so many people feel that they need back pressure, because back pressure is a very popular topic to get today because people care about streaming frameworks. Uh, other people don't need back pressure. If you're programming a synchronous system, which is typically uh, some sort of hardware, where you have a hardware bus and you have some bounds of the number of events you send and receive, then it's wasteful to have back pressure in the first place. Some people don't need back pressure. Others do. And most people do today because they're communicating mostly over the internet and you care about these things. So should we have back pressure in this MASIC model? Some people say yes, and some people say no. I think I agree with the former group. Because the back pressure channel is essentially the following. It's some sort of a channel over an unreliable network, where on the left side you have a sender, and on the right side you have a receiver. But the sender is only allowed to send if on the left side it has a light bulb called available, which is turned green. If it's not green, then it's not allowed to send. And this is basically what the back pressure is. And the state of this light bulb on the left side will depend on what the receiver tells back to the sender. So one way you could implement this in terms of protocols that you saw earlier is to declare something called a back pressure pump. And a back pressure pump is essentially an, an event buffer, which is also, it, it's a buffer, which is also an event stream. And when the events come in, you put them into this buffer. And then you call the queue on that. And when the client decides to call the queue on that, so the important thing is here is when an event comes in, it's not a link immediately portrayed to the user, to the, to the server, back pressure pump in this case. It's, it's just stored in this buffer. And then when the reactor on this side decides, I want to consume this event, then it will call the queue on this entity. And calling the queue will not only emit the event so it can be used in the rest of the application, it will also send a back pressure token along this reliable channel back. And now you can think different ways of doing this back pressure channel. One way to do, is, do this is to declare a pump type, which is a tuple of a queue and an event stream, and then declare this back pressure pump in a few lines, which I'll not go in detail in. I leave it to you to think about. Uh, I agree this is one way to do that. And on the client side, you have to have this light bulb telling you when it's OK to send and when it's not. And I call this thing the back pressure valve. Why a valve? Well, because a valve is something which is on which you're only allowed to apply elements when the valve is open. And this openness will be represented by this thing on the left, which says false right now, but normally could be true. And when it's true, I can send events in on this thing on the top. So how will the back pressure valve work? Well, when it receives a reliable, uh, when it receives a token on this back pressure, channel, it uses it to increase the counter associated with this valve. When the counter is above zero, then on the client, on the user of this protocol side, 
you'll see the value true. It's fine to send. And when it's true, when this state changes, it will also emit an event to which the user of this protocol can react to, and then, and then send the event that it wishes to send from the producer side to the consumer side. And when doing so, it will also have to decrease the counter. And if it decreases it back to zero, it will turn the valve back to false. And then the event would be forwarded back to the reliable channel. And this valve type, it's a tuple of a channel that you send to. And a special kind of event stream called a signal, where a signal is an event stream that also caches the last value that it produced, which I think it's very simple to do. And uh, I left, leave it as an exercise. But if you have these two abstractions and you have this valve, then you can use any two-way connection that's already established to basically uh, map the sense that you have um, and the acknowledgments, that is the pressure tokens that you get from the server uh, into a number, which can go, grow or, or fall down as, as different events come in, and then filter only uh, the states when this this thing is available, and only when it's available, forward events. And then basically return this tuple, and that, that would be your valve. So I'm not going to go into details again. This is something kind of left open, potentially as an exercise. And you know, at, at the end of this protocol stack, stack that I talked about, you might now think that um, this is very complicated. I mean, we saw a lot of different types. We saw a lot of different methods. We saw a lot of different implementations of these things, a lot of different concepts. But I would like to remind you that what you just saw is the way that a power user sees the system. The end user sees the system through a very different pair of sunglasses. So the guy with the pitchfork, when he wants to think about the back pressure, he would do something like, like the following. He would call the back pressure server method, use it to spawn a special reactor called back pressure. And then on the client side, it would call a method called open back pressure, which on an event, when it actually establishes a back pressure connection, produces a valve object. And this valve object you can then use in a while loop. So for as long as the valve is available, you can send requests. This is how the, the end user sees the system. And you know, we only barely scratch the surface here. So I would like to conclude this with a thought that today, when you build a single threaded program, you basically think in terms of iterators and monads and zippers and UI toolkits and collection frameworks, and you don't build a web page using assembly. And yet, for some strange reason, in distributed systems, when you build a system, you think in terms of RPCs and message sense which is an assembly in its own right. I have found it useful to think about distributed systems in terms of its basic building blocks, the algorithms such as vector clocks and Lamport clocks and broadcast and consensus and gossip and failure detectors and so on. If you do it this way, then distributed systems that you love and care about will seem like nothing more than components which are made in, in terms of simpler components and when you do things this way, you basically see some truths which were not apparent to you before. So I urge you too to give it a try. Thank you. So, are there any questions? That was a lot of information. So the question was, why did I assume that the message can be lost? So the question was the following. I assume that the, any event on this unreliable network uh, could be, could be uh, delayed indefinitely, but could never be lost. And why did I assume this? Well, a simple reason is because um, this uh, lecture is not unbounded. It has a finite time. 
So I cannot, I, I'm not smart enough to reasonably uh, explain this, um, in this in this amount of time and maybe not at all. Because it's a difficult problem. And, um, um, and actually some systems are like that. Like you can, in certain systems, assume with a very high probability that the messages will never be lost. And this is potentially a high-speed Ethernet network, which is confined to, to a very, very specific set of, uh, uh, a very specific environment. And now, of course, there are other systems, like the Internet, where this is not the case, where messages will get lost. And I argue for this, you would need to change in the, in the protocol that I showed, you would need to change the implementation of uh, this method called reorder to do something else. So maybe you can have an idea of what you could do. I argue that one of the things that you could do is uh, create a timer event stream. And then according to some heuristic from the server side, which expects events to come in, send from time to time inquiries to the client side, asking where are my events. I think I lost them. And if you did this, as long as you have the guarantee that the transport layer eventually delivers some message that you sent, if you do send something infinitely often, then you would receive this event on the server side. So basically what you would do, you could track the events that you received, and if they don't come, if there's something missing, you ask the client to send it back. And then if you don't get a reply after a certain time, you do it again and so on. Now, this is not easy to do correctly. So a New Jersey style of person would basically do the simple thing first and let the users figure it out. Because after all, the users have a better insight in, in use cases sometimes than the designer has. So, you know, for now, this question is delayed, but as the standard library associated with this grows, this will be addressed, of course. Comparing the Tarkovan model, we have three features that I see. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay, we have three features in the Tarkovan model, and I see two of these also in the reactors. Spawn new reactors, spawn the new reactors, and the other spawn in the deliver messages to other actors, reactors, whatever, and we have open the channel. Uh -huh. Change the behavior. And uh -huh. I don't see in this API uh -huh. uh, a way to change the whole event uh, mm -hmm. stream process. So the question was like in the standard actor model, beyond the message creating actors, message sends, and message receives, uh, you can also change the behavior of the actor. You can change the way that the actor responds to incoming events on this channel, and the actor has only one such channel, right? And in this model, it seems like you cannot change uh, what an event stream reacts to, how the, the event stream basically treats this connector. So what I would do, so I obviously have again two options. I can add this as a new primitive in my programming model, or I can maybe think in terms of how can I use the existing primitives to implement this. And I argue that you can do this by uh, creating a new protocol which takes an event stream as an input and returns a new event stream which only emits the first event of the input event stream. Then you could change product, then you could change behaviors every time an event arrives and change the behavior to something else. Right? Does that make sense? So, so the idea is basically that this event stream object has a method called once. When you call it once, you get a new event stream back, which just returns the first event of the original event stream. And then you can install a callback to this once, which to the original event stream now installs a new, new event handler. One thing that I also didn't mention in this model, there's, it's slightly more involved than that is that every time you call on event, you get back a subscription object. And this subscription object basically represents your subscription. And if you call unsubscribe on that, you will cancel your on event. 
handler, right? So that effectively, this means that um, that you can, after a certain amount of time, decide that you're not no longer listening to events coming on this event stream, and you can install a new set of event handlers to this event stream. So you basically are saying that it's calling new reactors instead of the previous one. No, 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 no. In the in the existing reactor, I instance some event handlers. And then I react to a certain number of events on those event handlers. And when I decide that the time is right, a certain set of conditions is right, and I need to change my behavior, I call unsubscribe on the respective subscriptions. And when I do, I also call on event on the same connector again. And then I send a, install a new behavior. And then, of course, this is a very patched together way that you can do this. But maybe you can think about a method that actually does this where you call the method FSM, and you give it a set of behaviors as an input, and a set of mappings between input events and those behaviors, and which does the thing automatically for you. I think you could do that. Right? What is the event and what is the message for uh -huh. you and how I can uh -huh. deal with uh -huh. the rejection? Okay, so the first question is what is an, a message, what is an event? Yeah. There is absolutely no difference, I just want to distinguish from existing stuff. Okay. So it's the same. Yeah. Okay. So the, the next uh, thing is, the next question was uh, how, what, so we had the server client protocol, right? And then the server client protocol always had to respond with a certain response, right? But in some cases, you want to somehow give the client uh, a, a message, uh, basically a piece of information saying, this request failed. And this comes from the server, this information that it failed, right? So I would argue that maybe the simplest thing you could do there is to define a new method for the server, which for this generic function doesn't take a function from T to S, but it turns of, takes a function from t to option of s, or from t to try of s. Something that may represent a failure. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then, basically, in this protocol which is built in terms of server client, you could yeah. represent I failure. I got, a, I got a rejection, or I got an event string that I can pursue. In both cases, you would get an event stream, but that event stream would either yeah. return a, a, a success event or, or a failure event. Yeah. Good question, thanks. So uh, apparently we're out of time for questions, so we have to give it to the next speaker. So thanks a lot for listening and yeah.